So welcome everybody. This we're the Call of Guys. I'm David. George is going to be joining us here shortly. He's running just a few minutes behind, but we are uh, so happy today to finally have on a guest we've been tracking down for a, a, quite a while to get him to come talk to us, Dr. Akil Ross with Lexington Richland School District 5. Welcome, Dr. Ross. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Well, wonderful. We're looking forward to a conversation with you, but before we get started, uh, we need to hear a quick word from our first and our longest sponsor of the Color Guys podcast, uh, Dick Dyer Mercedes Volvo. This episode is brought to you by Dick Dyer Mercedes Benz, the first Mercedes Benz in South Carolina. So, welcome back, Dr. Ross. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with, uh, I, I'll say, a colleague, uh, because I'm, you know, you and I have talked. We, I've sat in your <laughs> role before. You stayed at I'm it sure. much longer than I have, and, and I have all the admiration in the world for anybody that wants to do your job, that being the superintendent of a school district. Um, so let's get started today. Why don't you give us a little bit of the uh, Akil Ross story and your background, kind of, you know, how you landed in the superintendent's chair and, and, and why is leadership and education your passion? Well, you know, uh, the, the brief, yeah, my story started with failure, um, in overcoming failure, um, uh, I, I start my education journey um, as a student who failed the third grade. I was a third grade repeater. Uh, here we are in the state of South Carolina with a, a recent Act 114 that uh, talks about uh, students who are not ready for the, the fourth grade must repeat the third grade again. And I, I empathize uh, with that because I was one of those students. Um, you talk about the students from inner city um, and, and uh, behavioral problems, special education needs, can't read, um, single parent household in poverty who's just felt the third grade. That that was me. I was yeah. that Um My mom comes up to the school and she says, um, my son is a good kid, even though I wasn't doing any good things. <laughs> at school. And she says, um, he just needs a good teacher. He's a good boy. He needs a good teacher. Yeah. The principal, Mr. Bannister, uh, gave me uh, uh, Miss Chavez. Miss Chavez uh, saved my life. Uh, she was yeah. very old school, um, but she could believe in the child long enough until they believed in themselves. And that's kind of what I think leadership yeah. is: is believing in a vision when other people don't see it. It's it's having something called faith in the future uh, versus being crippled with or crippled with the. Uh, the realities of the present. And I think a great educator, a great leader can see the future past the, the, the present. They can, they have that vision. Uh, and she just wouldn't let me fail. She wouldn't let me give up. Um, um, I, I remember having straight F's. I, this is back in the day. You remember that the handwrite, <laughs> handwrite the, handwrite you know, the report really cards. Yeah. Somebody. You handwrite all yeah. F's, right? You you get to the bottom and you realize, I haven't given him a passing grade. For, and you know, now we're going to keep it going. Uh, wow. But she, um, she, she, I would fail and she would say, do it again. Do it again. And what I've learned, David, it wasn't that uh, smart is getting it quick. Uh, smart was how hard you worked. And so uh, that built a, a work ethic. Uh, I left that. And um, by the end of sixth grade, I won two city broad essay contests. And wow. Michelle comes back to me and says, I told you you can do it. Now do it yep. again. So I, I, I've taken that into uh, academic success and coaching um, and mentoring. Uh, and so when I was a teacher, that was my philosophy. When I was a coach, that was my philosophy. I became a uh, a assistant principal through a fellowship. Okay. Uh, ended up uh, paid for my master's to become an assistant principal and a leader. And I kept the same thing. Assistant principal at Chapin High School. Yeah. Uh, I've, everyone who knows me, I focused in on the least of these of ours. All of the kids that were like me with this, a program called the Cell Program. Uh, when I became a, a principal, uh, we developed this notion of a heartbeat. Uh, and from um, programs like uh, ALA for our gifted students to the sale program for um, our, our, our struggling learners, 
uh, we were able to accomplish some some amazing things. And so with that, uh, ended up uh, traveling and writing a book uh, yeah. about uh, the power of, of what what when you can ignite someone's passion to learn what, what can happen. And so I uh, was asked to uh, be interim superintendent and then eventually became the permanent superintendent of uh, School District 5 of Lexington, Richland County. So that brings me here. And yeah. uh, I'm excited uh, to continue that journey of, of, of inspiring uh, an amazing vision. Um, and I start every board meeting off with that. We start off with vision. We talk about yes, vision sir. every board meeting. Well, that's such an amazing story. I didn't know the beginning part of your background, but I just want to say this. What a testimony to resiliency that you are um, for not letting failure define you or hold you back from becoming the person that everybody else saw in you. Um, I think too many times students let that define the rest of their academic career, that setback, and they don't, they don't get that next good teacher that picks them up. You know, my, my, my first teacher that I remember that, that picked me up is, is Miss Julia Clark. She was my fifth grade teacher and she's still alive to this day. And we still awesome. talk every, wow. about every year. Um, but, you know, so it, it, what a testimony. And I'm sure I, I hope the students that you speak to, I, I'm sure you 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 see the light in them. Come on. Like, wow. Did that happened to him. You know, so I'm I'm sure you've had a tremendous impact on students over the years, you know, more than other folks. So um, I, 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 I give you I give you, you know, any I have a lot more respect for you now. <laughs> Even though I had a, a lot to begin, you know, yeah. so, so let's shift gears a little bit because I work in the real estate business and with, with my co-host George will be here with us in just a minute. Who's a Dutch Fork high school graduate. Right. You know, a lot of people, you know, are always asking us about the school districts. What, per, tell me what's unique about Lexington Richland district five, because you guys seem to be, one of the school districts that we hear first a lot of times about interest. So what, what makes you guys special? First is the longest name in the state of South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful. You can't, uh, you go to the doctor's office and where do you work? Your employer, and it'll never fit in that line. <laughs> but, I think the uniqueness of us, our history, um, uh, we asked our, our staff, why? Why do you work in School District 5? What is the special sauce? Um, 998 of them replied on a survey, open, open, um, ended survey. Of the 998 that responded, 86% of them said two verbs, two verbs. We love our students and we want to see them grow. Wow. And um, 100% of them said it's about our students. And that was the collective vision of our school district. And so the secret sauce there is just those two verbs. When you love students, you, 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 you do extra for them. You treat them like your children. Um, and we don't always get it right, but we're trying to constantly get it right. Uh, you're you're going to do a Saturday uh, a field trip with them, or you're going to stay late in the afternoons and, and do that extra uh, club, or or go the extra mile to uh, to 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 bring that experience into the classroom. Uh, when you love them, you're going to see more in them than they see themselves. And then when you're committed to seeing them grow, you're you're looking at what do they don't know, and, and how do I scaffold material to so that they can learn it. Uh, we love them and we want to see them grow. In fact, uh, it's uh, part of our uh, unofficial logo here. Uh, okay. We have a, a pen and an image, you'll see it around that we use uh, with the heart and the leaf. And it basically, the heart stands for love and the leaf is for grow. And that's our constant reminder of, of our secret sauce. If, if you have those two things, uh, then, then, uh, you're a great fit for School District 5. 
And all success stems out of that, our strategic plan, um, 24 strategies chasing four basic goals, those four basic goals chasing two visions. Every child feels loved in our schools and every child has demonstrated academic success in our schools. Well, there is great power in symbols, right? So I love that y'all have found a way to visualize that. And I love that you've made it that simple for folks to understand because there's no reason anybody can't communicate those two things right. immediately. You know, when they walk in the door and go, well, why should my kid go to here? Cause well, we, we want to love them. We want to make them feel loved and we want them to succeed. That's right. You know, so, you know, because success, you can define it in a lot of ways, right? But um, finding the right way for a student to do that just means so much more, especially in an environment that cares for them. So you, you, you and I were talking before we got started, just, you know, we've launched into the school year and once it starts, it just kind of takes over. But, you know, where do, what are your priorities for this year? What are, what are some of your big goals during this academic year? We've set um, three major, in addition to our strategic plan, three major goals, uh, priorities. The, the first uh, is uh, still dealing with uh, the, the shortage in education. Um, you know, there is a lot of mistrust of government um, from local all the way to, to the federal government and getting people uh, that would, would, would be a part of a community uh uh, of a school district uh, that says, I want to continue to love and grow students. Um, and so as we uh, we bring them in and, and, and we show them that this is a place where the community supports you, that we know these are easy jobs, but uh, we, want, we want you to know that you're supported and loved by our community as you love and grow its children. Uh, that's our priority. And so it's really just speaking life into education and educators um, uh, as we, we deal with this teacher shortage. And so that's our first priority. Our second uh, priority is to support those classrooms. Dave, it's interesting to see what's uh, in our classrooms today. If you did not teach after COVID, um, you, you can't really relate to what the teachers are dealing with today. And why, why I say that is that uh, while we may not be doing dealing with the the spread of virus, what we are dealing with is the impact of, uh, of the, the social and emotional issues uh, that are in our classroom. Um, the rates of uh, depression and anxiety that are in our children. Now, there are many factors that lead to this, uh, but uh, uh, th those demands on teachers are higher and higher. Uh, there is... Um, uh, really, we live in a constant state uh, of of our, our children. I can remember the the I don't I didn't go through it, but remember studying the duck and cover days, right? <laughs> yeah, when, when you, you thought it was an imminent threat of a nuclear attack, and they would say your desk would protect you. You get under your desk. Well, our our students live in a in a constant state of security and safety issues, and if you understand how the brain works. You can't get to learning if you don't feel safe. You have, to have, you have to have two conditions met to learn. One, you must feel safe. Two, you must feel loved. If you feel yep. safe and loved, then you're in a position of learning. So many of our students come to school and they're not in that position where they feel that they're safe and they're loved. And so schools now are responsible uh, for bringing them into those, into those uh, mental modes. And so uh, when you talk about uh, school safety, I have to make sure each and every day, my daily prayer is that 17,300 students get to our campuses and back home 180 times a year. Yeah. Before we've learned anything. Yeah. And so uh, we can't take a day off in terms of safety and security. So that's, that's our, our piece. And so supporting our classrooms uh, we're seeing a range and uh, we looked at an eighth grade classroom. It has eight different reading levels from second grade to ninth grade in one in one classroom. Uh, yeah. The behavioral issues, the, the th those are things. And we're talking about our children. So our children are in a situation where they need help. They need support. They need to feel safe and love. And um, 
we as a school are, are, are taking care of those wraparound services. And then a third objective uh, priority is, is really creating an environment uh, where uh, we can meet these needs. When you were in school, David, uh, do you remember passing the sensory room? Exactly. No, I do, do not. not. Do not. <laughs> <laughs> there are no. a lot of spaces in schools that, uh, I, however, we have more and more what we call uh, elopers or what, what the community yeah. may know as runners, students who, because they, that first condition of not feeling safe is not met, yeah. they, they flee school. Um, you know, we, we have a code, it's called Code Nike. Um, you know, there's a runner. So you see uh, teachers, yeah. administrators, they wear tennis shoes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and because of, of these increased challenges uh, that, that we have, uh, we're learning more about how to meet these needs. And yes, sir. Um, fleeing one sensory environment to another sensory environment is showing us that you know, we, we have to have spaces and places to meet the, these, these students' needs, to, to get them to be regulated, to be in a learning environment. And so um, being in a learning environment, putting, thinking that you can put 25 kids uh, in one room uh, for six hours and that's going to work. Uh, I challenge anyone to take their grandchildren yeah. <laughs> and 24 of their friends and sit them down <laughs> in one oh, room, two hours. Absolutely. Uh, and so when you say all that, it makes me think of, of, of two questions because number one, you're meeting, that's like, it's very stressful to, to try and be everything to everybody. Right. If you're the teacher in the classroom and you're trying to meet the social, emotional and intellectual needs day to day, class to class, it's it's it takes a huge toll on on your teaching and your administrative faculty. And so talk to me, because I know you got your your district seems to have, you know, have a, a reputation for being one of the best districts to work in in terms of the support in the environment. What what are you got what are you doing as a central office to support your schools, your schools administrators to make sure their needs are being met to go into the classroom every day to to you know be that person that their student needs them to be. I think the first question is to just keep asking are we doing enough? Yeah. Uh, we asked our um, teachers of the year and um, um, to talk to us. They did a, a year long study of, of things that we can do uh, to help support them. And they said yes, there, there's, there's two things they want to feel valued and they want to know that they're growing. And so I said, well, what does feeling valued mean? And, and, and they did a survey and it came back with, with three things. And it was interesting. Everybody's conceptualization of value is different. What you say is a value to you is not necessarily a value to, to, to everyone else. So you, that's very individual. Uh, so yep. you can't just do a blanket value statement. It must be specific to David or specific to George. It has to be specific. Uh, so there was three categories in which this value came in. Um, number one was words of affirmation. Um, it was very clear. When you speak about education, are you speaking about the reality? If I'm speaking about real estate, but, I, and I, but nothing I say actually meets the reality <laughs> of what's going on, you know, uh, uh, then, then you're losing. I, I don't feel like you even know what I'm going through. How could yeah. you, you know, how could you value me if you can't, you can't, and then speak to the contributions I'm making in this space. So yeah. if, if, if you don't know that we're dealing with students of high needs, um, then, then you can't ever recognize the work I've done in that space. Number two, they need time, quality time. Now you want to think about how much uh, has been added to schools. Every time there's an event in society, you hear say, they need to teach this in schools. <laughs> and so we hear this a lot. They need to teach this in school. Why don't they teach that in school? Why don't they teach that in schools? Well, if you look, think about this third grader. All right. Currently today, that third grade teacher 
has uh, 180 days to teach. What's interesting, that same third grade teacher, if you look, and I'm, I'm going to pull it up here uh, now, that same third grade teacher has about 234 standards to teach in 180 wow. days. Well, and, and take that even further, right? Because I remember my days as a principal doing scheduling. You back out all the time. <laughs> that is not instructional time. So no, and then yeah. you look and, and then very you look good. At what man. They you have. know the truth, right? That's the truth. Yeah. So we I back mean, out it, twenty days. Yeah. Your testing windows, field trips, uh, assemblies, sick days. Back out twenty days. You have hundred and sixty days to teach two hundred and thirty-four items in six in six decades of school reform of all of the things that were added to be taught in schools. Not one minute has been added to the day. No. And so, if you no. come in behind, right? It's not two hundred and thirty-four things to teach in one hundred and sixty days. It's right. three hundred things to teach. <laughs> And so, or six hundred, uh, or seven hundred. It's a yeah. it's a lot, and you're dealing with children who are two, three, four. Uh, so sometimes, well, why can't they catch up? Um, what a third grade child is learning today, um, and compared to the standards of the fifties, it may be four x, and what is required of that of that child. So uh, it's just a lot of demand on that. Uh, we're exploring how to support the teachers so that they can support our our students. Yes, sir. Well, I know, I know you you talked about you know that it's not just work um, in the classroom, but it's you know in in the school, but it's out in the community too. Um, we had the opportunity to talk with Julia Scott about the work that you guys are doing over in Harvest and Gardens to go out into the community to address some of these issues around student needs, student well-being, so that when they get into the school, that, you know, is less of an impact. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, beyond the school, what y'all are attempting to do to, to make sure you know, we're not putting kids behind when we don't need to. I think it's one of the most important um, initiatives we've taken on. Um, we're funded uh, from from eight to three, um, but the three to eight, right? Well, that's that's that child needs something. You now, for yeah. uh, our children are blessed. Like we're going to put around, put them in in in. Uh, music or, or karate or, or athletics, they're going to be in something. Uh, they're going to go to the museum or library, but for some of our children, uh, they're not getting that enrichment time. Um, you know, we all struggle with the cost of, of, of child care. And so for some of our families, it's not an option. Yeah. We met with our families and, and we started looking at um, our, our social workers uh, were, were coming back to us and say, you know, Dr. Ross, we go to them and we talk about reading and writing and arithmetic. And they talk about housing security, food security, and child care. Yeah. Uh, and so until their needs are met, our our expectations won't be met. And so it, it, who's gonna who, who's gonna go first? So for us, it was it, it was an easy decision to turn to the community and say, let's wrap around communities. Um, that that don't have these supports. A lot of them are, are, are these Section 42 housing uh, uh, developments, uh, and and then we would be we would partner uh, with the management company and the owners uh, to provide those supports. Uh, a child that does not a child sees itself as, as their day, right? If if in my in the middle of the day I I, I have some reprieve, but I know I got to go home back into an unstable environment. Um, then I'm, I'm not in that safety mode to learn. Yeah. And again, everybody's brain works the same. Before you learn, you must feel love. Before you feel love, you must feel safe. And we have to meet those two conditions in order to get the academic growth. Being in the community is helping us uh, uh, to do that uh, and meet those imperatives. Yes, sir. That's awesome. And I'm glad to see you out there doing it because from what I understand, you've gotten far enough in the 
several times now y'all have been into that community, particularly that, you know, you've kind of cracked the facade and now you're getting in there and working. And so I, you know, I applaud, applaud you for having the vision to do that. And then, you know, you know uh, getting, Julius Scott yeah. and his team and uh, Dr. Harris and the resources they put around in the office of student services has done a tremendous job. They said at the beginning, that we're not doing yep. this to the community, we're doing it with the community. And I think Absolutely. that's what helps us kind of uh, um, have that sticking power is that um, they are uh, active participants in the work that's being that's going on. Yes, sir. Well, um, unfortunately, George just pinged me. He's not going to be able to join us. He just oh, got out of his meeting. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I, one last question for you, and then just to, to get you back out there doing what you do best, which is you know working working with the schools. What what's your biggest challenge in your district in the next five years, and and what are your thoughts on you know how how y'all are going to go about addressing that? I, I um, honestly believe our, our biggest challenge is communicating to the community the realities that are in the classroom today. Preparing our children yeah. for their future is so much different from preparing them for our, for our past and the resources that are needed to do that. Um, as we, we talk about a referendum that's before the community, I think everybody arcs back to when I was in school, right? And uh, they should do things as it was done when I was in school. Uh, and I would just ask that those, you know, kind of walk a mile in, in our current parents' shoes, see the challenges that they're up against. Um, the, the, the class size needs, the, the legal expectations, the amount of standards and requirements that are on, um, the, the constant communication streams and expectations, the individualized learning plans. There are no standards anymore. Every child has individual uh, prescription in terms of learning and feedback. And so having the spaces and places to do that, um, communicating that need to our community so that we can maintain ourselves as the number one school district. My biggest fear is that we do not innovate for the future. And as a result, um, we slowly get taken over uh, by innovating school districts. Um, people move here for the community and the schools. Um, if we don't innovate, uh, if we don't meet the challenge of, of today and the future, um, I, I don't think uh, we, we will be able to maintain that. And so that's our challenge is communicating our realities uh, to our community. And I believe with the strong communities we have, uh, once we all get on board of, of the vision, um, there's just no limit to what uh, Lexington Richland 5 can do. I, I don't think I, I don't think anybody could say it any better than that. And um, I, you know, I know the election's coming up. I know you can't say this, so I'm going to say it for you. Lexington Richland School District 5 has a, is a big bond issue out there for the voters to consider i know y'all spent a lot of the spring and summer talking to the community about that educating them about the impact that that has um on your ability to go forward and 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 secure the vision that you have for the students and the teachers in your district so you know from our perspective you know we're going to say everybody get out there vote for it it's it's not a tax increase this man dr ross has figured out how to pay for it you know, going forward. So I, I hope the voters support you in that way to give you the capability to continue to do your job and, and push forward the vision that you have for the district, sir. So, um, you know, uh, I know we, I, I'm not going to ask you any right, questions. Right, right. On district time, I can't have endorse, but uh, no, we appreciate you no. being informed. Well, listen, I have a lot of respect for you and, and the job you do day to day. Uh, thank you for having the armor and the very positive attitude to do it. We always love seeing you at the Greater Irmo Chamber of Commerce luncheons month to month where y'all come in and recognize one of your students and one of your teachers. Um, 
and appreciate you being there to, you know, just interact with the public. So I know you are well respected throughout the community. So Dr. Ross, I will, you know, keep, be respectful of your time and to say thank you for joining us today. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can have you back on in, in the near future and talk some more, but uh, appreciate you sharing your story and, and sharing about your school district today, sir. David, thank you so much. We certainly appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you. This is sponsored by Bell Carrington, Price and Greg. Bell Carrington is our choice for the best real estate attorneys in town. They are highly communicative and make sure that the closing process is as smooth as possible. With offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama, they can handle any of your real estate finance, eminent domain, financial services litigation, and litigation needs. Call their Columbia SC office today at 803-509-5078.